introduce uh, Julia Matoivasan, who uh, introduced this morning also. She shared the EMT analysis methods tutorial this morning, and she'll be chairing the opening plenary session on grid forming technology applications. You can tell that grid forming technology is uh, quite high on everybody's priority list. Everybody's talked about it so far that's spoken today, so it seemed like an appropriate way to open the conference. So Julia is the chief engineer at ESIG. She's been with us for a couple of years now, having spent 10 years at ERCOT as a uh, chief planning engineer, and we're very glad to have her. So Julia, let me turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Charlie. Uh, right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to uh, ESIG workshop. Um, we'll have uh, yeah opening plenary session, as Charlie said, all about uh, grid forming technology applications. Uh, in this session, we have a presentation from manufacturer, uh, from a consultant that works a lot with connection studies uh, and system wide level studies. Uh, we'll have, uh, and then we'll hear from um, two developers. Uh, so kind of we have a representation from different um, stakeholder groups here. Uh, and initially coming into the session, I was planning to have like a little bit of opening, but I think Professor Devan did an amazing job for me introducing grid forming technology and what it is and why are we talking about it. So all I want to say is now, you know, that we are getting more inverters uh, on our systems and synchronous generators are retiring some of the services that synchronous generators kind of inherently provided before and we um, got used to rely on. Uh, now, as they're going away, we need to think about how the system needs are changing, what services do we need and what inverters can do for us. And, you know, inverters with controls can be fairly flexible and there is uh, a lot of services that we can get from that. And so that's what you'll hear about here. Uh, and first, uh, we have Frank Baring, uh, who is uh, head of business development uh, in over large scale um, in SMA America. And he'll talk about grid forming technology and project specifications. Frank, go ahead. Good afternoon, if that didn't wake you up. So uh, thank you, Julia, and thank you, eSig, for, for having us. This is my first eSig conference, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. It's an impressive venue, impressive audience, uh, impressive topics, and I'm excited to talk to you from an inverter manufacturer's perspective. What is grid forming? Uh, why do we care about it? Uh, what can it do for the network? And uh, I'll wrap it up with a little bit of real world uh, example or use case. So do I just hit the arrows? Which one? Space bar. Sorry, we'll figure this out. Me. All right. Great, thank you. Okay, so again, my name is Frank Baring. I'm the head of the business development uh, for our large scale segment at SMA America. Uh, let's talk about what the fundamentals are of uh, a grid forming inverter uh, from a manufacturer's perspective. I think it's gonna mirror quite a bit what you heard earlier today, but maybe with a little bit of a biased take on it. And I, I wanna start with saying for SMA, when we talk about grid forming technology, we are specifically talking about battery energy storage. Uh, it's not because Grid forming technology can't be deployed uh, with other energy sources like uh, PV or wind. But as you'll see, as we progress through the slides, the, the advantages of grid forming inverters are I'll say most prevalent or most capitalized on in battery storage applications because you have dispatchable uh, power and energy from the batteries. Uh, I'm actually going to skip this slide because I think Deepak covered it quite well already. Um, maybe just a, a couple of quick words. When, when I entered the industry in 2010, uh, inverters were primarily used in PV applications, and we were really just asked to pump power into the grid, and that was it. So that was the main purpose of the inverter at that time. 
Uh, over the years, we've become more of a, a grid supporting technology. And now as we approach those higher percentages of IVR penetrations in the grid, uh, we're being asked to do more as an inverter when uh, this is where grid forming and acting as a voltage source uh, comes into play. So real quickly, from a inverter's perspective, the difference between grid following and grid forming. On the left, you'll see grid following. Uh, this is where the inverter is looking at its terminals and uh, uh, detecting the voltage and frequency of the grid and then synchronizing to it. And we dispatch current uh, according to set points and commands. Uh, in contrast to that, a grid forming inverter uh, uses the PLL phase lock loop only when it's first started up, but not for control. So we, we have to you know, recognize the, the voltage and frequency when you first turn the inverter on. But after that point in time, the phase lock loop is not used and we're controlling uh, voltage and frequency. A quick graphic of uh, kind of what I just said, but the different control modes of an inverter grid following on the left where we're uh, dispatching active and reactive power and in different, different fashions. Uh, you can prioritize active power over reactive power or vice versa. Uh, you could program the inverter to always operate at a specific cosine fee or a specific power factor, et cetera. Uh, or you can follow predefined curves. Uh, in a grid forming inverter, we're using droop based controls. Uh, so power is a function of frequency or uh, reactive power is a function of voltage. And then we also have layered on top of this, uh, what we call an inertial mode. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about what that means here in coming slides. I wanna show you quickly the difference um, between a inertial response and a, uh, uh, excuse me, a droop response. And uh, the red line here on the bottom graph is what the inverter is doing uh, in droop mode. And the blue line is an inertial response. So in droop, you are proportional to the change in frequency. Uh, whereas in the inertial control mode, we're acting in proportion to the rate of change of frequency or the derivative. So they're, they're quite different uh, and they have say different, uh, different benefits to the grid in terms of bringing stability to the network. Synchronous grid forming. So building upon those controls, we talk about synchronous grid forming at SMA, which is to say we're operating uh, synchronously or in synchronism with a larger network. So as I mentioned, we detect the voltage and frequency at the very beginning of turning on the inverter, and then we're, we're operating in, in synchronism with the network from that point forward. Uh, these are always voltage source converters when we're talking about grid forming. They are compatible with the existing networks and uh, that control mode acts to bring about uh, stability and strengthening of the grid. And uh, draw your attention to the, the last comment on this slide, which is we see this as very fundamental, very key to enabling uh, very high penetrations of renewables, if not 100%. So what does grid forming unlock? Uh, on the right-hand side of this slide in red, you'll see services that are only possible in grid forming control mode. And on the, the left side of this graphic in blue, you'll see services that are possible in grid following mode. So we're very used to uh, things like fast frequency response and arbitrage that you can do with batteries and those kinds of services. But the grid services unlocked by grid forming control modes uh, are really what we see as, as the fundamental, uh, I'll say, point of the whole discussion. It's, it's, it's not that we are operating in grid forming mode that should be important to all of us in the room. It's what we're doing for the grid when we're operating in that, and that is stability services. So we can provide inertia um, with uh, all of the decommissioning of fossil plants that you've 
heard about so far. And I believe the number I most recently read was 83 gigawatts of planned fossil decommissionings by 2030. Uh, inertia is quickly disappearing from the network. So the ability of a power electronics device like this to bring inertia back to the network is critical to continuing on this path of, of more renewables on the grid. Uh, we contribute to system strength. We're able to operate in an islanding mode. So the disappearance of the last synchronous machine on the grid, we continue to operate. Uh, and black start or restoration of the system after a complete outage. Again, those are, those are capabilities that only a grid forming inverter can bring. So uh, a big part of my job is running around the country talking to the ISOs and explaining, uh, most of them already have a fundamental understanding, I would say, of grid forming, but they ask a lot of questions about how do we specify this? How do we really, really bring this to be on our network? So the next couple of slides here are an inverter manufacturer's perspective on what specifications should look like. And based on what I just told you about grid forming, it, the specifications naturally follow very closely. So an inverter to be considered grid forming should be operating in voltage control mode. That means it has an internal constant voltage phaser that it's presenting. It's operating in synchronism with the network and it's able to operate stably after the loss of the last synchronous machine on the network. So it's able to go islanded. And then in addition to that fundamental operation, it should have the capability of providing the stability services that we talked about on the last slide. So system strength improvement, uh, an inertial response, and short circuit current provision. That is what we view as the fundamentals of a grid forming specification in general. And then for a project specific application, we need to quantify those stability services. So inertia in megawatt seconds as an example. Now I wanna talk a little bit about a question that was asked in the earlier session. Uh, can we just turn this on? What's, what's the difference between grid forming and grid uh, following? Can we just flip a bit and, and change this into a grid forming inverter? Uh, the answer is it depends as most of answers are in this uh, engineering environment, but understanding where these capabilities come from is really important to this discussion. For a, an existing SMA inverter, for an example, uh, we can turn it on in software, so to speak, but you won't get the same benefits to the network as you would if you designed a plant from the very beginning with those stability services in mind. So I'm going to talk now about what you get in a grid forming inverter all the time and what you have to design for. All right, so the, the bar in blue here at the top of the slide are common behavioral benefits to the network um, with a grid forming inverter that are there always. Instantaneous response to grid events. So this is a, by nature of being a, a voltage controlled converter. Uh, the reaction of the inverter is not to a command, it's instantaneous. It's the physics of, of being in voltage control mode. Uh, it's adaptable, adjustable, tunable. So it can be uh, modified, not just project by project, but over the lifetime of a project. If you, if you find that the need for inertia is increasing, you can adjust the parameters uh, accordingly. Uh, you, you enable extreme ride through capabilities. Um, Extreme is kind of a relative term, but let's just say much more capable in terms of ride, full, ride through than a grid following inverter. And uh, therefore you're reducing the risk of, of tripping um, under adverse conditions. Now at the bottom of the slide, we talk about this, the stability services that, as I said, are enabled by, by grid following mode or grid forming mode, excuse me. And we talk about on the left side of this, what's possible uh, let's say through a retrofit or through just no change at all to the fundamental design of the project. And on the right, what's possible if you design around stability services from the very beginning. 
So inertia, for example, if you just were to turn it on in the field, the amount of inertia in the moment of need is going to be dependent upon the power and energy accessible to the inverter at that moment in time. So the state of charge and what the battery uh, is doing, right? If it's uh, already discharging at 100% of its capabilities, then there's not power and energy available for the inverter to use as inertia. Um, in contrast to that, if you design around specific inertial needs from the very beginning of a battery plant, then you can have these capabilities 24 by seven by 365. Yeah, the same with a, a current boost. And why that's important from a design perspective, a battery plant is designed around its use case and developers in our industry, they get paid for these use cases and that's how they make these projects economically feasible, yeah? So they're typically paid by the ISOs to do arbitrage or smoothing dispatchability of, a, of the assets or frequency control. And you design power according to those use cases. Stability services, if done in our view properly, uh, are designed on top of that. So you have headroom or design reserves of power and energy to be able to execute those stability services at any given moment. Now, in terms of inertia and short circuit, these look a little differently and that's what we're portraying here on this slide. So the horizontal line, if you can see it in the middle of the slide here, this represents say the, the rated power of a battery plant um, in its basic use case, whatever that base case was. If you don't design power and headroom into the project, in order to have an inertial response, you have to take that power right away from the base case. So you have to derate whatever the base case of that plant was. In contrast, on the right, you stack, you stack that power uh, up on top. Short circuit level is a little bit different. It's the same concept, but it's not a linear change. So you could add just as an example, 10% more inverter capacity to a plant and get 200% more short circuit level capability. And that's really critical when trying to justify the economics of designing a plant in this fashion. Uh, this is a slide showing you a couple examples of what these uh, short circuit boost profiles could look like. Um, the duration and the amount of boost are programmable, but you have to design around these things, both in terms of the inverters limits and the power and energy, right, on the battery side of your plant. So I'm drawing close to my end of my slide deck here, but I wanna, I wanna contrast these advanced grid forming capabilities to the typical kind of a grid asset that we'd see trying to solve these stability problems on the network, which is a SYNCON. Uh, SYNCONs are usually designed for specific quantities of uh, reactive power and inertia and fault current. And that's all that they do. Yeah, they sit there and that's what you're paying for. Uh, a battery storage plant, uh, in contrast, you have the base case that I already mentioned. You can provide frequency control. Uh, you can provide arbitrage. Uh, if you've heard of a grid booster, this is another use case for battery storage for transmission deferral. Uh, these are all things that can be monetized by the developer in addition to those stability services that we talked about. So we're stacking revenue streams in order to improve a project's economics. And my colleagues at the table here will go into that in much more detail in their coming presentations. So uh, that's really important to the next slide, which is a, a real study. Uh, the Pathfinder projects in the UK is what I'm about to show you here. And I'll wrap it up with this. So in, in this project Pathfinder, this program, uh, the ISO in the UK went out to bid, not for SYNCONs, not for battery storage, but stability. 
So they, they opened a tender for short circuit provision and they opened this tender around inertia and they quantified this. And then in a technology agnostic way said, bring me your solutions and bring me your cost. What, what would it cost for me to get a gigawatt second of inertia from whatever solution you're, you're offering me? And what you see in red were the, the tenders from Syncons. And what you see in blue was the offered amount from the battery storage plant. And you'll see that for inertia, the battery storage plant was dramatically lower dramatically lower. That's possible only because of that stacking of revenues uh, that makes that, that battery plant kind of the Swiss army knife grid assets. Uh, in short circuit provision, it was you know, closer to similar, but still, as you can see on the graph here, advantageous. Now, somebody in the earlier session over here asked about why aren't we building these things already? Why, why don't we just do it? And one of the answers, there's no single answer to that, but one of them is, is here on this slide. And that is for the IPP community, the developers of these projects and the owners that get paid for these different uh, capabilities of a battery plant, they can monetize arbitrage and they can monetize uh, uh, frequency support, but there's no market mechanism in the US at least today for stability services. That's a big part of why we're not seeing this built. It costs developers more money in order to design a plant with the headrooms necessary to provide stability services 24 by seven by 365. And they don't wanna pay that money uh, without being compensated for it, right? This was not the case in what I just showed you in the UK they went out to bid for those stability services. And I would just wrap it up with, uh, from an inverter manufacturer's perspective, this is really fundamentally critical to our progression forward as an industry and getting to 100% renewables. When we see the ISOs come to the table and say, we'll pay for stability services, you show us how we get the stability and show us your price. We'll, we'll find the battery storage is uh, not only competitive, but I, I think very compelling. And this will open the floodgates to, to deploying grid forming inverters, uh, but also to the further penetration of renewables. And that should be for all of us, I think, the end game. So with that, thank you, get your attention. Hope that was helpful. Thank you, Frank. And I think it's a very good segue to what uh, Lucas is going to talk about. So next on is Lucas Unro from uh, Electronics. He's a lead study engineer there, and he'll be talking about are all controls, grid forming controls created equal? All right. Perfect. Here we go. All right. Thank you, Julia. And um, thank you, Isik, for having me. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Lucas. I'm a uh, work with Electronics. We're a study consultant out of Winnipeg, Manitoba, and we primarily do EMT studies um, in the interconnection space, but also for other areas as well. Um, our experience in grid forming has mostly resulted from uh, studies done in the Hawaiian Islands using, um, you know, kind of OEM supplied grid forming models for real, pr real prospective projects. Some of which have been built. Um, as well as working with various entities to develop grid forming specifications um, for you know, um, incoming batteries that, they, that they're requiring to be grid forming. And today I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned through that experience and as it relates to grid forming controls and um, point out some differences in behavior that we have seen. All right, so a brief intro here. So grid forming batteries, they are, you know, they're no longer an abstract concept that only exists on paper. There are large transmission level connected grid forming batteries in Hawaii, in Australia that are providing grid benefits today. We are expecting to see the use case for grid forming go beyond the 
um, the basic voltage phasor attribute, which Frank described uh, very well. And a few of these use cases um, uh, might be subsynchronous damping. We generally see much better subsynchronous damping spectrum from a grid forming inverter. Another one that Frank also mentioned is, is inertia. So we can, um, you know, based on your, depends on your definition of inertia, it's not that the voltage phaser can't get you something that looks a lot like inertia, um, but we're starting to pay more attention to um, what the inverters do for something that looks like inertia. Um, another one is, uh, is that, that uh, we can, depends on we configure these devices, we can actually make them look in kind of a Q priority mode, mode and kind of look them more like, make them look quite a bit like a statcom um, to the system. And as we see these use cases sort of developing and evolving, um, I think we should also be um, evolving our testing of these devices and starting to look at these control aspects in more nuance in our performance studies. So the first thing I'll mention here is just a few of the kind of common constraints, I would say, that all grid forming inverters would have in common. So the first one would be that they, you know, the basic definition of grid forming, we want them to look like a, vo a, a voltage phaser in the transient time frame, and, um, and that has an associated set of benefits like loss of less synchronous machine, weak system, uh, phase jump power, fast fall current injection, um, all, all that stuff. So then on the on the right side here, you'll see this is a, a figure from the uh, a recent NERC white paper on, on grid forming functional specification, where you can see in this red circle there, um, this in this situation, the grid forming inverter picked up um, uh, load, which was dropped from a synchronous machine that was tripped. It picks up that load, you know, basically within half a cycle or so. Um, and yeah, you can see in that current. So this is just kind of an example of that, that phase jump um, uh, characteristic. And the other reality for all grid form controls is that they have to deal with current limits somehow, right? Just because we're acting like a voltage phaser doesn't mean we can now ignore all current limits on the device. We have to do something when there's fast transient on the system um, to be able to limit the, the output current of the device. Now, what aspects of the control do, I see, do we see as variable? One, the main one here is what we would say inertia response. And um, I would almost characterize characterize this as you know a period of time after the initial phase jump to when the voltage phaser is fully synchronized um, with the with the system or or when the um, power uh, power plant controller will sort of dominate so I'll show you what kind of what what I mean by that in a, in a future slide um, but essentially there's there's a number of ways that in, that the grid forming inverter is able to output energy in the time frame that you're having a frequency reduction event and it's not that you're only limited to a rate of change of frequency response. Um, if you wanna make this as a kind of a technology agnostic response um, sort of definition, then you think you have to be able to accept, um, you know, responses proportional to the changes in frequency rather than rock off as well and other mechanisms, right? Uh, we don't really care how the injection is done. We just want power in a useful time frame. And depending on what you mean by useful time frame, that doesn't mean that inertia response can only be done by grid forming. Um, if it's a, if you have a you know high inertia high inertia system, you might be able to get uh, grid following that can act um, to kind of help boost that that uh, response as well. Within the reality of current limiting, there's many different ways that that can be done. Uh, we can have you know we can have direct control over the voltage phaser, uh, which we you know you can do current limiting in that in that scenario as well. More often than not, we have sort of a cascaded control structure, which actually has a current, uh, a current control loop. So you could put limits in that loop. There could be hardware implementation. There could be you know, a purely software implementation. Um, you can use virtual impedance, and then you can just sort of define hard current limits. And there's kind of you know, pros and cons to all these, all these topics. This has got to be one of the, like, the most well-researched topics um, um, you know, out there in the past five years. So there's lots of good reading content on, on IEEE if you're interested. Um, in this. Um, the last one, frequency domain characteristic. Um, so as we kind of know from um, experience doing subsynchronous control interactions, the impedance that the inverters have in the subsynchronous frequency range is tunable based on the gains of the device. And that's the same case for grid forming. So we can, um, there's a potential that we can tune the gains to maybe get more damping at certain frequencies 
um, if we're seeing instabilities uh, in those regions. So this could be potentially used to mitigate subsynchronous control interactions in highly serious compensated systems. So I'm gonna show you two examples of responses that we've seen in the Hawaiian Islands um, uh, in some recent studies. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, just a brief primer on what the Hawaiian Island system looks like and what kind of dynamics these devices have to deal with. So in this Hawaiian system, we have a lot of DER. In a lot of the studies, it makes up you know, close to half, um, half of the kind of load essentially is being served by the DER. We have under frequency load shedding, we have legacy plants, we have uh, grid following and grid forming plants. Um, that were that are kind of under study, and then we also have synchronous machines uh, in the mix as well, but very small amount of them. Right, these systems are extremely weak, extremely low inertia, and when you put all these things together, you very you get a very complex set of dynamics. Um, we have movements in voltage phase, magnitude, frequency, and they're all moving in sometimes unexpected ways. And you know it's. Since the system is so weak and highly sensitive to the injection of these devices, there's a closed loop effect of all these devices happening in parallel. So none of them are really having, you know, kind of a, an open loop type effect and are able to just ride along with the rest of the system. One thing that we have noticed, uh, you know, and this is not, this is not specific to grid forming necessarily, but um, our grid forming specification tests that we put these models through doesn't, you know, passing all those tests doesn't mean we're going to get perfect performance in the system, right? That's why we don't say, that's why the kind of uh, model acceptance process is not the final arbiter of, um, uh, you know, good performance of the system. We need um, interconnection studies. Um, and the final, one of the final points here, so some aspects of this island-wide analysis are not going to translate very well to large interconnects, but I think there is aspects of the um, of the performance that can be refined to increase the, the you know, get better performance in, in all scenarios. Um, also, these plants are not necessarily in final design. So if you see some poor performance, just, you know, these, these, uh, um, these uh, results are kind of still in, in progress. Um, and, um, you know, it, there will be improvements yet before they're kind of finalized. All right, so the first one I'm showing here, this is what I would call, um, a, a, a very extreme frequency event that, uh, that we studied here. So we have an event, uh, uh, a short fault that results in like a lot of generation that trips in this scenario. And you can see the frequency is going down to 15, 8.5 Hertz. Um, so this means that some UFLS has actually triggered um, as well that you're not seeing here, but we're getting, um, you know, so, so everything that's doing frequency control has to work really hard in this scenario. Um, so I've plotted three different uh, grid forming responses here. And um, uh, what you'll see in the first sort of red sliver there is the phase jump response, okay? So right after the fault, the fault clears and all these grid forming devices, they realize there's a bunch of generation missing on the system. So it's a, it's a different phase angle on the system. And so they instantly inject a lot of current and that's physics, as Frank was saying, right? We can't really do anything about that. And that's great. That's what the system needs. And right after that, the voltage phaser starts to synchronize with the system and other sets of dynamics kick in. So right after we get the peak of the um, phase angle jump, phase angle power, essentially, to basically when the, um, the frequency kind of stops falling, that's what I would characterize as the inertia period. And within that domain, we get a lot of different, uh, a huge variety of responses between these three devices, okay? So we'll start with the one on the top. One on the top is giving us um, essentially a response that's proportional to the frequency deviation. So we could say this is like, um, it has a very small inertia constant um, in it, and it's just, it's just giving us power up to one per unit, okay? And that's a nice response. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's not really going over the top and doing anything surprising necessarily. Um, and the next one down is, is quite a bit more interesting. So this one is giving us um, the phase jump and then we have um, you know, a, basically a transient power response that decays almost back to pre-event conditions before picking up again due to plant controller action. So this is fairly interesting. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it looks a lot different than the first one, right? So, so um, 
in, in this case, the grid form of controls are kind of like a have a transient behavior and there's not really, um, they don't necessarily have a steady state contribution. So it's up to the plant controller to kind of fill the plant level frequency um, objectives. Um, but it is giving us a lot of power in that time frame. So actually it is, it is doing uh, quite a bit to arrest the, the uh, frequency drop. Now the bottom one is again, different um, in its own way. So this one is, is it's actually doing a, a lot of work. This is kind of like a wow response. Like it's starting at like maybe 0.5 per unit um, charging and jumping up to like 1.5 per unit discharging very briefly, right? So it's, it's actually giving us a really nice response. Um, what we kind of think is happening here is that the kind of inverter level has a very small droop constant. So a small change in frequency, it's gonna give us a huge change in uh, power response. And then after that, we get the plant controller dynamics kicking in, kicking in again to bring it down to kind of the plant controller power frequency um, objective. So there's three different flavors here of response. I think, um, um, you know, they're all, they're all very different. Um, if I had to pick one that I like the most, I'd probably say the third one because it's, it's the largest and it's also um, very well controlled. Um, compared to maybe like the second one that kind of has this kind of strange up down behavior right so but I, I would say all three of these are doing um, uh, are, are supplying an inertial response um, in their own right. Okay, so one another example here, um, this one is focusing on a on a different part of the response okay. Um, uh, this is uh, the event we're looking at here is a prolonged fault it's like. Um, ha almost half a second, so it's a very so it's a delayed clearing fault. Um, and again, the system is very weak, very low inertia. And at fault clearing, which is around 10.4 seconds, you can see a little arrow with fault clearing there. Um, that's when that's when the fault clears. And at that time, we have the load in the system picks up again, but our DR um, has sort of a slower recovery time frame. So it, there's a lot of energy missing on the system for a brief period of time. So transiently, there's, um, there's a kind of a power mismatch in the system and somebody's got to kind of pick up that, um, uh, that power, right? So um, th this is a very challenging condition for grid forming inverters. Um, this is probably kind of like, if you were gonna design a test that is gonna break uh, grid form controls, it would be something like this because we have um, a long period of time where the inverters have to limit their fault current and while they're in that phase, they have to do some things to their power synchronization mechanisms. They might have to freeze some states and things like that. And now, okay, we're also gonna drop the frequency to, uh, you know, by half a Hertz during that time. And then you're gonna have to pick up a bunch of megawatt and megavar load um, coming out of fault. So it's very extreme. This is like super deep end um, type, type uh, um, conditions here. And then the system does eventually get uh, saved by UFLS here. So we see the, uh, this, it doesn't quite fall apart, okay? So let me focus on these responses one at a time a little bit. The, uh, the one I'm showing here, this is actually a grid following inverter. And uh, it's actually behaving, you know, basically as good as we would expect a grid following uh, inverter to behave. So active power, active current, that's the top graph, uh, is sitting at about zero before and after the fault. It picks up a little bit afterwards, um, you know, in response to the, to the low, low frequency on the system, but it's not really giving us a lot of fast or, or, um, uh, or voltage like characteristic response, which is, which is what we predict. It's good following. It wants to be a current source. The, and then on the reactive current side, it's giving us uh, about uh, 0.5 per unit injection. So this is just going to be on the, the K factor controls of the device. Uh, overall, you know, for a good following, three stars out of five, not too bad. Um, now, before we say, why don't, hey, this looks like pretty good. Why do we even need grid forming? Just know that this system is not, it's not small signal stable without grid form, forming, okay? So we've studied this uh, many times before. You, you know, without grid forming, you get right from the start of the simulation, you'll start seeing um, uh, small signal oscillations, okay? Um, now, this next, this next one is a grid forming response. It's quite interesting um, what it's doing here. So um, this one, we know a little bit about how maybe the, the guts are working a little bit. So we have some idea that it's, on, it's, it's kind of locking 
its internal angle, not internal angle, internal frequency during the event. And so you have, you know, the grid frequency is 59.5. The internal angle is about, the internal frequency is about 60. So we get a divergence in the angle between the internal angle and the system angle at fault clearing. And due to that, we actually get, you know, in a, in a situation where the system is very megawatt and megavar deficient, this grid forming inverter absorbs a bunch of uh, megawatts and megavars from the system. So it's kind of doing the opposite of what we want um, and then ends up kind of tripping. So this is kind of like um, equivalent of, of pole slipping, I guess, that you get for grid forming uh, controls. Um, so this is, you know, this one we would say control tuning is needed and they need to have kind of a better way to synchronize the internal angle to the grid angle while the current limited. This next grid forming here is doing something fairly similar to the previous one. Um, we don't, the, the operation is a little bit more opaque uh, of, of this one. So we don't know, really know what's happening inside. Um, but our guess, you know, based on its behavior, we would guess it's doing a pretty similar thing to the other one, uh, except maybe not quite as, as, as bad. So this one again would get a kind of a one, one out of five and it needs, needs to have some work on this one. This last grid forming one is doing basically exactly what we want. Okay, so this is really what we want things to look like. Um, during the fault, we have a lot of reactive injection up to one per unit and some, some, uh, some uh, active injection as well. Um, uh, and then at fault clearing, uh, it's actually, you know, boosting it's active current up to above one per unit for a while. So it's really trying quite hard to um, respond to the, the kind of lack of, lack of megawatts um, on the system. And it's actually keeping its, its uh, reactive injection up as well uh, above zero. So um, this, is, this one is really you know, doing quite well. Um, we give this one kind of like maybe a four or five uh, um, if we had to grade it. Um, a few other things to just take note of in these, in these results. One is that the grid following inverter stays small signal stable throughout this whole time. So that means that even though the grid forming inverters are you know, totally out of whack, they're, they're doing the wrong things, they're still voltage phasers. So even though they're not synchronizing properly to the system, they're still small signal stabilizing the grid following inverters, which is kind of cool. Um, um, the other thing is, you know, I, I intentionally picked a very bad and challenging case to show you. Um, I have many other plots I could show you of grid forming inverters doing very, very nice things in this system. Okay, I just wanted to um, point out this, this specific aspect, which maybe is interesting and is maybe uh, a challenge that's still remaining. So a few closing thoughts here. Grid forming controls, like we've already mentioned, there's lots of benefits for these devices, but like any device, controls can fail during an interconnection study. So we have to be careful um, about making these kinds of control changes. Grid forming controls are highly tunable. I showed you three different responses and they, you know, they look vastly different. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do with our controls to address some of these performance concerns. The only constraints that we really have to work with is our definition of grid forming our fixed voltage phaser that we need and our current limits. And within those kind of parameters, there's a lot we can, uh, there's a lot we can do. Um, a few more thoughts kind of, uh, 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 kind of bleeding into the wider uh, ideas of how grid forming can be adopted. Um, so, you know, how, how can it be adopted? There's, I think there's a few mechanisms, right? So grid code or market changes. So minimum capability requirements, you could think of this as being kind of the stick uh, market incentives, this is kind of the carrot. Um, so there's kind of pros and cons to, um, to both of them. Um, I, I, I think probably, uh, you know, grid forming has, has benefits to a developer, in my opinion, um, even if they're not necessarily getting um, paid for those specific uh, stability uh, advantages that they're bringing, because there is a lot of capability inside of the base package without having to add an extra inverters to get um, extended inertia benefits and things like that. And, and I do think there will be, um, or, or I just finish this. So minimum capability requirements on this side, you know, we've seen the charts, there's hundreds and hundreds of gigawatts of grid following uh, batteries going into our system. Uh, in, you know, they're in the queue right now. 
And it's inevitable, but that some percentage of these are going to be involved in stability events in the future. And I think it's avoidable if we start making some of these grid, for, grid forming, right? Um, so I think there's a there's a there's a, a a lost opportunity in that sense. And I think there will be some natural adoption um, based just on developer preference. Um, perhaps there might be, you know, for a hybrid plant, if you're doing an interconnection study and you see a stability issue and you had a grid, uh, a grid following battery, well, let's make that grid forming and see if the stability issue goes away, right? So there's gonna be some natural um, least cost mitigation that's gonna happen as well. Um, and also some developers might choose it as sort of a stability insurance, even if they don't see something in an inter interconnection study, they might say, okay, I think we're gonna get better performance for our other resources in this area yeah, if we do grid forming. So why are we paying so much attention? Why are we zooming in so closely to, uh, to these performance nuances? Um, the main reason is that if we do get widespread adaption of grid forming, then we need to be ready because uh, you know, we're gonna get a lot of these on the system, right? Potentially in a, in a short time frame. So the, the progress that I see would, you know, as, as, we, as we get grid forming, we're, we're gonna get capability of those devices to stabilize our system is gonna go up. And then we're gonna start relying on those capabilities. And then, you know, because we're lying, we should be looking a little bit closer. Um, and then, you know, I think as a result of that, we're gonna get some short-term complexity in some cases. And, um, you know, I think that's pretty normal um, to have that sort of complexity when it comes to new technology adoption. Um, so I think that's, you know, in my opinion, that's kind of a small price to pay for the, uh, for the system benefits as well as the potential benefits uh, to the developer of, of uh, building grid forming. Thank you. So much, Lucas. So after all the flavors of grid forming, yeah. we have a, a two developer perspectives. So the first one uh, is uh, Amit Barnier. He is a vice president of US Networks Infrastructure. It's a NOBE. Uh, and he'll be talking about grid forming, battery energy storage project development experience and future plans. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everybody. Uh, honored to have been invited to speak here today because I am not an engineer by background, but I do hope to provide you all a unique perspective about why, and more importantly, how uh, a developer and independent power producer would go about deploying grid forming technology on today's grids. Um, so with that, my name is Amit Barnier I'm from Zenobi. Just by way of background, Zenobi is a global company focused on three main divisions. Uh, network infrastructure, which I represent today, uh, deploys and focuses on transmission scale energy storage with a heavy focus on grid forming technology. Uh, we also have a fleet business focused on EV fleets that we uh, basically provide turnkey services um, and also have a second life business. So already thinking about how we commercialize end of life batteries coming off of these buses and transmission scale energy storage systems. As I mentioned, uh, I'm here on behalf of the network infrastructure team and we have a very specific focus. Um, we're headquartered in London, but we operate globally. Um, I'm actually based in New York City and focused exclusively on the US market. And our uh, network infrastructure team really focuses on, on a very specific business case. Um, standalone energy storage, 100 megawatts or larger, transmission connected, uh, really in markets that have full and form access to everything that an energy storage system can provide. And I'll be going into a bit of that shortly. Um, but really focusing on additional value add um, in terms of providing location specific grid services. A lot of the things that you know, the previous panelists and a lot of other uh, previous sessions have discussed today, which is voltage, uh, fault current and inertia um, to really bolster up worldwide grids and support the uptake of, of renewable energy. Um, we collaborate with grid operators, top tier integrators, consultants, and really what, what my role is, not being an engineer by background, 
is coordinating a complex set of stakeholders, um, both in resources, both internal and externally, to make sure that grid forming technology is adapted. Um, this slide here is not to boast at how great my team is, but I think we are a little bit unique in the sense that Zenobi has a very heavy focus on engineering. Um, from my previous experience in, in working at a previous developer in the United States, I would say most developers focused on grid following technology uh, probably have about 10% of their staff focused on engineering. The remainder of that's commercial, business development, market folks, uh, people who focus on offtake. Um, Zenobi is trending around 30%. And a lot of that is because we decided to focus a lot on more complex deployment of energy storage systems, specifically grid forming technology. Um, and, and I think that's really, once again, going back to where we find value. We find value in deploying energy storage systems that aren't simple, ones that are more complex and are providing above and beyond what most people would think of in an energy storage system in the United States currently. Now that sounds great and all, but I think what would be even more interesting is how we're doing this and where we're doing this currently. Uh, Frank touched a bit from SMA touched a bit on the UK Pathfinder process. This is something that Zenobi was very active in and we actually um, participated in Pathfinder too. That was the first uh, Pathfinder process that the UK operator launched that was technology agnostic, right? So the previous one was only focused on traditional transmission uh, assets, syncoms, shunt reactors, uh, capacitor banks. But the second Pathfinder was open to all technology and Zenobi really saw an opportunity here to harness grid forming technology to participate in these tenders. Now, the reason for that is um, the UK uh, system operator, National Grid ESO, recognized that being technology agnostic means that they can bring more diverse set of resources to solve the issues that they were facing. Uh, I think somebody asked before uh, during a previous panel, like at what level of renewables penetration do grid operators start to need grid forming technology? I can tell you from our experience in the UK, it's once you break around 30 to 35% um, intermittent renewable generation where your grid needs change dramatically. Um, that's where things like short circuit level um, in inertia become really, really critical. Um, they become critical in the sense of if you have major loss of load events, the system needs to respond very quickly and in doing so in a way that, you know, is different than the way grid operators are used to. Um, in the case of the Pathfinder contracts or the Pathfinder process, um, about $100 million worth of contracts were awarded to energy storage. Um, and Frank showed a little bit of the economics there, but on paper, uh, about a billion dollars of grid savings uh, are realized through this. And this is against more traditional uh, single use transmission assets. And I think that's really an important piece to recognize here in terms of the developer perspective or the IPP perspective. We don't want energy storage or grid forming technology to be a single use asset, right? The, the, the value energy storage in, in a grid forming level can provide is being able to provide the full range of services, right? And this is doing grid services alongside traditional uh, generation, frequency um, support um, and arbitrage, right? I think that's, that's kind of inherent in the business case here. And I think once grid operators start to unlock and, and you know, not think about islanding or maybe islanding is the wrong word in this crowd, um, segmenting the attributes here, among these resources, you start to see considerable economic benefits. Um, I think some key things just to recognize here in terms of why Pathfinder 2 is successful in the UK, um, really the, the grid operator was very transparent about localized needs, right? And I think as a developer in an IPP, we take in uh, information that is given to us in order to make proper economic and commercial decisions, right? We were given very clearly a set of requirements on a localized basis that we understood and spent a lot of time from an engineering perspective trying to understand how that marries with our business case. Um, 
in, in our business case being merchant generation in a lot of cases. So I'm just gonna show three projects here that were successful in this Pathfinder 2 uh, tender. And I think they are representative of what grid forming energy storage can really do. Um, in total, Zenobi won 900 megawatts worth of grid service contracts with these plants. Um, and these plants here, I think are a little bit unique in the sense that they are the first ones that are going to be providing these services in the UK. Of the three, Black Hillock is the one that is currently going through commissioning right now. And I can tell you once you start adding grid forming technology and grid services, that commissioning process becomes extremely lengthy uh, and, and complicated in a lot of cases. Um, I'll touch a bit on that in terms of, you know, the, the process and the verification of the services that we're providing, because that is a very large part of the discussion that happened in the UK. But <clears throat> I think what is important to recognize here is the capabilities that, that we can provide with these systems. Um, and I think actually going back to what Frank at SMA was showing earlier, the per unit factors here in terms of the fault current and inertia that we can provide is actually very telling in the way that these services were priced into the market, right? I think you saw on that slide that Frank provided, inertia was extremely cheap right, or extremely competitive against syncoms. Whereas fault current was not as, you know, competitive. And the reason for that is, I mean, once again, I think is telling from the per unit factors here. Inertia is very easy for us to provide. Um, really doesn't take extra inverters to do so. Um, we are capable of providing that um, in pretty much all operating aspects, whether we're charging or discharging. <clears throat> However, fault current is much more challenging and we do provide, we do need to oversize our system and therefore it does have an economic impact into the way we bid into these tenders. Um, going back to what I was saying before, these were fully stackable, uh, stackable in the sense of we're still able to provide balancing uh, in arbitrage services that does make up a majority of our revenue stack that makes these projects possible. I think in isolation, an energy storage system, you know, would not be competitive with a SYNCOM in providing just fault current and inertia. Um, however, once you stack all these services together, um, you are talking about considerable savings to grid operators. And you're also talking about resources that are able to do multiple things at once, right? And I think that's where it gets really interesting from us in terms of a deployment perspective. Um, I think, you know, going back to, to how this is possible, I think the market signal is really, really critical for us, right? We spend a lot of time and effort upfront engineering proper solutions here. And given that market signal and the opportunity to compete and win contracted revenue was the enticement we needed as a developer and IPP to go ahead and actually dive into a, um, you know, tender process that traditionally was dominated by um, traditional, you know, transmission assets. And I think actually one important thing to close out here, even though we did compete with these projects uh, and energy storage did win within the Pathfinder too, traditional solutions were still very competitive. And I think that really comes down to the locational benefits of where these are, uh, where these energy storage systems are located. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, an energy storage system providing these services is not going to be in the location where those services are needed, right? And I think understanding the topology of the grid and understanding the needs of the grid are very critical in order to deploying these effectively. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the timeline, the compliance, the challenges. Um, and this was a long process. You know, I think like most grid operators, National Grid ESO was not open or receptive to this idea originally, right? And I think a lot of that had to do with the technology being rather new in terms of the deployment and not just necessarily grid forming technology, but energy storage on their grid to begin with. Um, Zenobi spent three years of active engagement with their regulatory group, specifically the GB grid forming working group. And if you look at the timelines here, Pathfinder 2 only was established following the update of the grid code 
that allowed grid forming technology to participate on the system, right? And I think that is very important to recognize. Like the grid code needs to be established in order for these systems to work and be economical and to compete against traditional solutions. Um, I think there was a lot of key challenges as well that needed to be overcome. Some of those are really related to how do you actually validate and recognize the services that grid forming technology can provide and doing so obviously well in advance of being deployed on the grid, right? I think the, the biggest hindrance that we faced initially is gaining the trust of the system operator to say, we can respond in the same way as SYNCOM can. Um, <clears throat> really what that took was uh, a, a series of different uh, requirements and, and that included dynamic simulations, factory acceptance testing, and all of that to be accomplished before we did any on-site testing. That also introduced a lot of complexity in terms of the contracting process, right? Like at the end of the day, I think about this from a commercial perspective and contracting one of these is very interesting because you start to talk about situations of how do you verify and measure what we are providing? Right. And I think that becomes like a very big question when it comes to grid forming technology, providing something like inertia, right? Inertia is not something that can be tested in a commissioning plan, right? It can be simulated, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of reliance and there is a lot of penalty and onerous on us if we're not providing that, right? So let's just say there is a grid event and we are the ones providing inertia uh, to the system to respond to that grid event. But there is still some type of compounding issues. And, you know, for whatever reason, we're even with the inertia we provided, there is some type of cascading event that happens on the grid. How do you go about verifying that? How do we go about saying as Anobi, we provided, you know, the services that were contracted for, um, but some other piece of equipment on the grid failed in that case, right? And I think that gets into a really complicated discussion around I think that gets into a very complicated discussion around verification, testing, and controls, right? And, you know, in terms of ESO's um, response to that, essentially what we're going to be doing is putting in dynamic system monitors on site um, that will be assessing post event what our system provided, right? Once again, this goes back to establishing the right level of criteria and trust with grid operators, because obviously in a post you know, event confirmation, you, know, you don't wanna be in a situation where we didn't respond. Um, you know, the whole point of this, I think from our perspective is to prove that we are capable and that we are providing the services that we've been contracted for. So, Talked a lot about what's happening in the UK. Um, I did want to switch this a little bit over to opportunities in the US. Um, I think at the end of the day, we don't look at the UK grid as being unique. You know, I think at the, at the end of the day, these grids operate in very similar fashions, right? Um, and the services we're providing there, we very much see a need for here in the US. One specific example I'm gonna to touch upon is the West Texas grid. And the reason I pulled this example, I think it's very well documented. ERCOT did a very good job of providing technical specifications for their proposed solution there. But when I see this, like I see an opportunity to deploy grid forming technology. You know, I think at the end of the day, ERCOT went about this in a fashion that is very much, you know, within their comfort zone. But I think if you look at this, um, and consider this in the light of how much energy storage is being deployed in ERCOT currently. Um, they broke eight gigs installed recently, are probably gonna be breaking 12 to 15 gigs uh, in the next 12 months. And we see that as an opportunity to harness what energy storage can do. At the end of the day, nobody is deploying grid forming technology in ERCOT currently. It's all grid following. And the reason for that is there's no market signal. There's no incentive for a developer and an IPP to go and spend the time, the resources, increase the complexity of these projects and the cost at the end of the day to be deploying these resources. However, you know, based on our experience 
we think that specifically in the, in the, the West Texas grid issue, which is facing a lot of um, growing stability issues due to uh, the rise of intermittent uh, inverter-based resources, specifically grid following ones, solar and wind, <clears throat> to deploy grid forming technology um, alongside their, their traditional solution, which is synchronous condensers, syncons. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, looking at these specifications here and these requirements, um, you know, 350 megavars of reactive power, um, overall two gigs, a little bit over two gigs of short circuit level, a combination of syncoms and energy storage with grid forming technology can accomplish this and do so in a way that's much more economical. Um, you know, from our review, um, right now they're going to be spending close to 360 to 480 million for six incomes to solve their, their grid stability issues in West Texas. Um, and really have like a timeline of about four years to get that deployed. When we think of an optimal solution here, um, and, you know, going about it in a similar fashion that the way the UK has gone about this, right? Opening up tender processes to being technology agnostic, we see a cheaper path and a quicker path to solving the issues that they're facing right now. Um, in our situation, based off of our experience, I think 300 megawatts of grid forming best uh, can be equally competitive with each 350 um, megavars of, of syncom capacity. And that's based off of, once again, the per unit factors that we're talking about before. You know, overall, we see savings of around 10 to 30 million uh, over a 10 year lifespan. Um, and not even a 10 year lifespan, the lifespan is considerably longer for these facilities uh, over a 10 year contracting period, which is enough of an incentive for a developer like us to start to think about that market as being attractive and deploying resources into it. Um, I think another important thing here is, you know, the way we think about deployment of this technology, it's not an isolation of saying, hey, here's the engineering challenge, or this is what this system is capable for. But we optimize that against what we traditionally want to do within the markets, right? So we look at capability as being a minimum service we can provide um, at, at all operational characteristics, right? Whether we're charging, discharging, whatever market signal we're responding to, we need to ensure that we can provide these minimum levels of capability. So I think to wrap this up, uh, some conclusions and recommendations. Speaking to, to grid operators um, and, and system planners, grid forming, uh, energy storage is already being deployed in solving the issues that modern day grids are facing in light of decarbonization, right? Um, we've seen this work in the UK and we think there's a lot of parallels with what is happening in the US on grids here. I think it takes a lot of work, um, you know, bilaterally with all counterparties here, right? And it takes a lot of transparency around the technical and locational requirements um, that are gonna solve this, right? We're not doing this in isolation. We're not just showing up with a grid forming technology. We're not just flipping the switch, you know, and going from grid forming to grid, you know, um, grid, grid following to grid forming and all of a sudden the issues are solved. You know, I think at the end of the day, we're really thinking about where to deploy these in the best possible locations. Um, and that takes information in order for us to, to make, you know, a, a good commercial decision. And I think at the end of the day, providing that, you know, market mechanism or that market signal is really important for us to even begin starting to do that work. Um, Zenobi actively engages in the regulatory uh, and advocacy cycle because we believe it's important. Um, and I think just kind of going a step further as it relates to kind of minimal stand minimum standards, which are being discussed uh, nationwide at this point, I think for, for grid forming technology, we are definitely believers that you need minimum standards, right? Like those are the guardrails that are gonna keep the system safe. But I think if you really wanna deploy grid forming technology in a way that really maximizes the benefits, both commercially and locationally, you need to go above and beyond those. Um, you know, and once again, that takes a lot of work, takes a lot of effort. And 
it, it takes the right signaling to developers and IPPs like ourselves in order to take on that additional work. I think in the absence of that, most people um, and, and most developers are gonna go with the path of least resistance, right? And I think you're gonna continue to see the proliferation of grid following technology um, on, on grids here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Um, so last but not least, we have an international guest, uh, and that's uh, Benjamin Brown. Uh, he's a principal engineer of uh, power systems control at Fluence uh, in Germany, and he'll be talking about integration of grid forming solutions for compliance on plant level. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you, Isig. Thank you, people in the audience, for holding through all of the talks and presentations today. Uh, one minor correction, Fluence isn't a developer. We are a provider, a global provider of battery energy storage solutions. We, of course, work very closely with our developers uh, to make sure that the solutions they're getting are fit for purpose, uh, but we don't actively develop the projects. And one other correction, yes, I'm international. I flew from Germany here but I was born and raised in Minnesota, so. Right, uh, I've been working with grid forming batteries for about 10 years now, and I think it's always helpful to think about where we started to realize where we are now and where we could be in maybe in the next 10 years. So 10 years ago, batteries for Black Start were kind of the only grid forming use case. You had also some island situations that were coming about at the same time. And you have, of course, examples of batteries even, even older than me that were potentially being used already in some isolated cases. But the thing about the Black Start use case was that you could really curate the load that your battery was going to see, the sequence of operations. And so you could really have a hand on every stage of that process. And for that reason, a lot of different PCS suppliers could provide grid forming controls that were sufficient. As projects developed more towards the isolated, I don't call them microgrids, because in my mind, a 10 megawatt or a 100 megawatt grid is not a microgrid. Um, but in these isolated use cases where you're running grid forming droop all the time, you have variable load, you have variable uh, renewables, suddenly you have a lot more uh, things to, to struggle with. And so the amount of grid forming controls or the amount of suppliers from PCS that can provide those grid forming controls starts to get a little bit more selective. Um, then you come one step further to where we are today. A handful of grid codes exist now with grid forming uh, operation described in them. And the amount of uh, controls and the performance that's demanded from them is much more precise. Uh, it's not just that they have to be uh, working on grid with all of those variable loads and generators, uh, you also have to survive a sudden islanding event. You also potentially have to be able to black start. And so again, the amount of PCS and their grid forming controls that can do that starts to get even more limited. So on those grid codes that are starting to, to be released with different uh, requirements around the world, this slide is, is not about competition. It's not about who was first or who has the most. It's about collaboration. And I think it's really great to see that as different entities around the world and different uh, grid operators start to come out with, whether it be a white paper, a recommendation or a voluntary requirement or a, a hard requirement, you do start to see quite a lot of cross-referencing. Um, whether there's an active discussion uh, amongst the colleagues, I, I can't say for sure but they are at least reading each other's papers, they're learning from it, and they're repeating a lot of the same verbiage, a lot of the same tests and features. And for myself as a solution provider or someone that's providing the, the components and the grid forming controls, this is great because it means all of our work starts to become a little bit more harmonized. We're not gonna have a UL version of grid forming and an IEC version of grid forming, right? <laughs> Please. So then that means everything's harmonized. Uh, there's no differences, right? Wrong, the market comes into play. We've heard 
from the previous panelists about the market, it's of course very important. Grid forming controls, the sizing for grid forming controls, the plant level controls on top of those grid forming controls, the studies to make sure that all those controls are controlling well together, that costs money. And there's currently what we've seen sort of three different schemes to, to either compensate, as in the case with National Grid ESO, they opened up their tender, they allowed batteries to compete with statcoms, with synchronous condensers, and those batteries are getting paid for that service. There's a cost out. AMO is saying, well, my grid is getting weaker here and here and there, and to strengthen that grid so that I can get more and more renewables, I need to buy statcoms or, or synchronous condensers. That's gonna cost me money. So if you as a new PV or you as a new wind or as a new battery energy storage system, if you can't reliably and stably remain connected despite a very weak grid, well then you have to pay me. So you have compensation, you have cost out. And then somewhere in the middle, what we're starting to see um, in, in the European Union and, and so E region specifically is more of a compel. They have as part of their requirements for generator, RFG 2.0, it's a new uh, requirement coming out that new generation coming on the grid, whether it's PV or wind or storage with a certain megawatts and connected at a certain voltage level will be compelled to provide grid forming services such as inertia. And the main thing we, we saw in some slides earlier I think it was 1,500 gigawatts of gigawatt seconds of inertia are needed in, in the EU, and they're not even sure that that's gonna be enough. There's some regionality in terms of if you have different system splits, you might need a little bit more here, or a little bit more there. Uh, you might even need asymmetric inertia, which as a controls engineer gives me nightmares. Um, that'll really keep you up at night. <laughs> if, if we come back to the questions, what keeps you up at night? Um, but these things, these things are being written into codes. We have currently a consultation with the FNN where it's under review. Comments were due last week, uh, but these are coming in and this is gonna be compelled. You're gonna have to start doing this after some grandfather clauses and whatnot within around about three years. The compensate and the cost out methodology, those were very focused on short circuit strength or just in general stability of very weak locations on the grid. The compel path that NSOE is taking is more for inertia, which is much more of a common good. It still has locationality, but you can start to see that there's all of these different market mechanisms that even if the grid codes were exactly the same, we're still gonna have to put together bespoke solutions. So on this slide, we've got currently 2000 MVA of contracted grid forming projects from Fluence alone. There's of course many other providers out there. So you can imagine layering those on top of that and on top of that, and maybe some PV and wind, at least pilot projects, you start to get to a very appreciable number. And some of those large targets that we saw in, in earlier slides starts to maybe feel a little bit more tangible. Maybe we're getting there. Of the 2000 MVA, about three quarters is fairly recently announced. So that means, you know, we, we don't yet have all of that built and um, installed, but we do have a fair amount of it. About 500 MBA is already on the grid operating. Another thing that you'll see here is that all of the industrial black start, some of those projects that I mentioned, that's how we started very early on. Uh, those don't even really show up in terms of the numbers because those are very small bespoke projects um, in the, let's say, five or, or below MVA, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. The big projects that are coming, they're no longer the isolated grid cases as we have in, in the Azores or on Madeira. The big numbers are finally coming to on-grid, grid forming on-grid. But they're coming in different flavors. You've got the grid forming short circuit level from Stadtkraft. This is part of the UK Pathfinder tender, but they're the project developer chose not to bid any inertia. They bid pure short circuit level support. And they won two projects on that. You've got projects in Australia that um, are according to that cost out mechanism, 
they want to reliably connect to a, uh, a weak grid. AMO uses the short circuit ratio as a metric for weak grid. And so they're not specifically providing X amount of kiloamps at their POI. They're not providing Y megawatt seconds of inertia. They're simply ensuring that they are doing no harm to the system strength and probably even improving it if they're in grid forming. So in order to do all of this, and because we don't yet have that UL and or IEC version of grid forming, because we don't have component level standards telling the SMAs and the other PCS manufacturers out there how to develop grid forming controls, that puts the responsibility on our shoulders. In order to sell that to a customer like to Zenobi or to anyone else, we need to make sure that the grid forming controls do what they say on the box. Then the first aspect of that is, do you have a box that says what you can do? Do you have that documented? Do you have a manual? Do you have a Modbus interface description or whatever protocol you use? If you don't have any of that, if you don't have a validated EMT model, then you can't do grid forming. You maybe have played around with it, that's great. I encourage you to continue playing with it and to start documenting it. But if you've reached that level, then we're gonna to go to the next level. We're gonna witness some factory acceptance tests um, over the years because we've come from those industrial black start to the isolated uh, island systems and now to the on-grid systems. We have sort of a, a repertoire of tests that we require from all of our different suppliers. Uh, we have about five different PCS suppliers that we've used for various types of grid forming projects. And some of them make it through, uh, through the gauntlet and they come to hardware in the loop tests, they come to power in the loop tests, and finally they come into actual projects and project execution where we work with uh, regional consultants to, to do the power plant control tuning. Some of these grid codes, they're not just talking about new challenges for the grid forming controls of the PCS. You have things like in HECO um, from Hawaii, you now have to ride through, I think, five hertz per second rock off event. This is challenging for a PCS, but there is a whole other bit of kit connected to our plant, and, and we can't forget that. It's too common that people think that a grid code really only applies to a transformer and a PCS. But there's a whole auxiliary system, of course, that is connected to that battery power plant. And without it, you don't have a battery power plant. So things like HVRT, LVRT, um, even the requirements before you're going to do a black start, you have to ensure your own critical aux is self-supplied for a certain amount of time, sometimes up to 72 hours. Um, when you're doing grid forming, you're responsible for providing short circuit. You provide, uh, you're providing inertia. To do those, you need a more advanced meter on your point of interconnection. So grid codes, and, and especially grid codes where you're performing grid forming operations, they come with many more requirements beyond just the controls and the PCS. This is a bit of a variation on some of the slides we've seen so far. A lot of customers think initially that's the initial expectations up there on the top left. They think that initially, yeah, you can just flip a switch and you got the same power, whether you're grid forming or grid following. And for some suppliers, that is more or less true. You still have to worry about the control dynamics than when you actually hit that nominal power, um, but they will offer you the same power in both grid forming and grid following. A lot of suppliers don't. They say that because of their controls and because of their hardware, they need their own buffer even if a grid code or a market service doesn't require that, they simply need their own buffer to be able to reliably operate in grid forming without hitting hard limits and then going into a cool down phase, for example. And so those I would put in that conservative bucket. It's, it's a realistic conservatism. They, they know their hardware and they say, that's what you get. So that's what I can sell. Somewhere in the middle, status quo, um, and then the trade-off, this leans into to Frank's slide. You put in an extra 10% and you get another 30% on top. So you don't have a one-to-one -one ratio. But in that final plot, I also throw in the battery because it's something that uh, I think is, is often forgotten in these grid forming discussions. I heard it once this morning, I think during the EMT simulations, 
all of the DC sources are, are very different and unique. And uh, at conferences, sometimes the, the wind or the PV people are very vocal about saying, no, 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 we can't do that. You have to push it. Wind likes to push it to PV. PV likes to push it to battery. And somehow everyone says, hey, yeah, the battery can do everything. And yes, we can, we can do everything within reason and with proper controls. And uh, the amount of inertia energy that a grid is actually gonna absorb or that we need to provide, it, it's a small amount of energy, but the effect of that sudden jolt of power into the battery, this can move your cell voltages in a, in a noticeable manner. It can remove them, especially if you were already set at 0% SOC or at 100% SOC, it can move them out of their allowed tolerances. Why would a battery power plant be at 0%? Well, it's waiting for a negative price point, which is coming more and more. Why would it be at 100%? Well, it's waiting for the $1,000 per megawatt hour so that it can make its, its keep on arbitrage. So these are real limits that we have to consider when we're designing our plants. Another one is the actual hardware configuration of the PCS itself. The top row, this is a pretty simple, straightforward uh, topology large centralized inverters connected by a, a dedicated transformer or maybe a, a multi-winding transformer, but with sufficient impedance between those two low voltage windings so that the systems are, are decoupled. Those are great for grid forming controls. It's very simple. However, for longer duration projects, getting into the three hour plus energy duration, you start to get into DC fault current limitations. And then you start to look to segregating into different DC buses to limit that fault current. But in doing so, if you also want to maintain your grid forming controls, you have new dynamics where you enter new modes for circulating current and common mode voltage, which you also have to consider in your plant design. None of these configurations is impossible to realize, but you have to know what you're getting into up front so you can avoid surprises on site. Something like this generally isn't looked at in terms of a grid simulation study because it's only focused on the AC. It's got a generic or, or an ideal uh, DC bus. And so these are things that um, we found we have to keep our eye on up front before we would be willing to qualify a PCS for a customer. On top of all of that hardware related uh, sizing aspects and technical considerations, there's also the power plant controller. So what I'm trying to depict here on this plot, you have various different capabilities. None of them have remotely the same units. So there's intentionally no scale there because you can't put them on the same scale. But the grid follower, the gray line, you can see that I've intentionally put that a little bit higher on PQ. That's because it can comfortably run at its thermal limits provide more power than a lot of the grid forming PCS that we work with uh, are, are willing to do. So there's, there's certain aspects where a grid follower can actually be better. Reporting, I've marked the, the grid follower a little bit better. It's not because it has more logs or it reports more data, but it's because for the use case, the reports and the logs I get are sufficient. Whereas for grid forming, the PCS suppliers still don't give me all the logs and data that I need. There's some things that our plant controller has absolutely no impact on, the harmonics um, and those uh, from, from all suppliers, both grid following and grid forming, those are the same. PPC can't, uh, can't improve that, uh, but it's important to know where we can improve and where we can't. Some of the areas where we can improve, inertia, as I just said, what happens to your inertia when you're at 0% SOC or 100% SOC? Um, Power oscillation damping, this is something that's inherent with grid forming controls, but with our PPC, we've found that you can actually expand that further, offer more oscillation damping. And then coming back to Black Start, uh, I mentioned earlier with self-supply, you first have to safely fall into an island when the rest of the grid has, has gone black. You have to then hold that island for a certain amount of time. You have to then, I might be getting ahead of myself, yes you then have to wait for a signal. If there's a major blackout and someone is seriously considering thinking using a battery for a black start, they need some time to, to really analyze the situation and to reconfigure their network before they would be ready 
to use that battery for black start. So there's a certain amount of time, uh, 72 hours is something that we see common from customers. And then once you get the signal for black start, it's great if you have a PCS that can ramp up its voltage, but what if you have 100 PCS or 200 PCS all on the same plant? How do you coordinate all of those together so that they ramp up their voltage in a cohesive way? How do you do it according to VDE 4130, a German grid code for the extra high voltage where the TSO can tell you, I don't really know what's going on on my grid yet. Please don't ramp up too quick. I've got a configurable ramp. Uh, I can tell you to ramp as slow as 10 minutes. Great. Some PCS can do that. Some PCS can't. They, they won't do a programmable ramp light. But even the ones that can, if you ramp your voltage up slowly over 10 minutes, all of that aux that I talked about earlier, which is also a critical part of your plant, it now has a subnominal voltage for the first eight minutes, maybe at uh, from minute eight, it actually finally has a healthy voltage where it can start to actively cool your system. And so all of these aspects uh, are where the, the power plant controller uh, allows us to, to improve performance. Droop versus inertia, we already had a very similar slide. Uh, this was a key thing when we were looking at the national grid tender for stability pathfinder two. One important aspect though, and that's the, the top two plots there, the response time for an external set point, if you're in droop versus inertia, varies considerably. Droop, the PCS can still uh, respond to an external set point very quickly. In inertia mode, it's actually hindering itself from responding to that external set point. And this was critical in some of those grid booster applications shown on a few slides ago, where we were helping the German TSOs to, to defer uh, transmission build out. Power oscillation damping. This is obviously a, a marketing slide here, but it is based on real measurements that we did in our test hall, where we could prove to a customer that, look, you have inherent damping from the grid forming controls, but on top of that, we can offer you more. So in conclusion, define to refine. Define grid codes, define the requirements. We heard that no one's gonna build it if you don't have a market, yes. But if you don't have a grid code or at least a, a technical requirement document telling you how to measure the contribution from all of the individual suppliers, then you can't really set up a fair market. So in order to set up that market, is our opinion you need to have grid codes in place and component standards. I, I didn't touch too heavily on the IAC UL. I, I made some jokes about it, but you know we need a clause for pro-islanding. Right now, no grid forming control would be allowed uh, according to the current standards because they enforce anti-islanding. But how can I anti-island if I'm actually inherently forming the grid? And does anti-islanding even make sense anymore? Perhaps for lower voltages, absolutely, but somewhere in the high voltage or extra high voltage, it probably doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, standardize the, the anatomy of short circuit from a PCS. I've seen so many different fault current plots. Let me see if I've got that in the end here. Yeah, this is a nice crisp behavior of fault current provision from a PCS. And I've seen so many different suppliers that deliver some dirty variant of this, that if I was a protection relay, I wouldn't be able to make a, a meaningful decision. I wouldn't be able to interrupt uh, the load based on uh, a fault current that isn't stable and that it's not what I'm used to. Jumping back to some of the final conclusions, um, in particular, high resolution time sync logging. I know that Kaiso is quite good in that regard uh, and they've instigated some some new requirements there a few years back. But as PCS and battery energy storage plants or, or PV or wind take on more responsibility for the stability of the grid, we need to actively monitor that and to have much better data because systems fail. Uh, even if I do my job very well and everyone else here on this uh, table has done their job very well, things can still get wrong. And so we need to have the data to help improve make it an iterative process. Thank you very much, I'm at time.
Thanks. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks to all the panelists. So we heard about capabilities, we heard about uh, specifications and how specifications can drive capability. We heard about developers and where, you know, the incentives for grid forming capability lane, uh, and then how it all goes together from, uh, um, from performance at the interconnection point perspective. So now I would like to open it up for questions uh, and you can um, come to the mic, introduce yourself 